Billy, you seem to have completely mastered the fingerboard. What can you tell us about the shapes and the patterns you use to connect the neck up? Well, um, I doubt if mastered is the word, but... Uh, oh, it looks like it. ...stumbled upon uh, okay. some form of uh, understanding of it. Um, when I play a, a particular scale, like we touched on in the last video, um, I have certain patterns that I use, uh, like for a G major scale. For me, when I play, uh, again, to reiterate, when I play a uh, a pattern in one position, like for the in G major scale, like right there. I do all the notes that you can do in a G major scale in that position, which would also include this low F sharp, even though right. it isn't really part of that scale, I just, just because it's contained in there. and It's a note that your finger can go to in that scale, exactly. so I do it. So, I, so actually, a G major scale for me then would be... Right. So I get them all in there. So now, another type of scale, the only other type of scale that I know of, actually, is the pentatonic scale. Well, wait a minute, though. You could get minor off the yeah. major. So yeah, because it's yeah. A, a major and minor I consider pretty much. And you're, you're pretty same. fluid with both sounds, major and minor, and you're playing. Well, that's it's pretty much because they're both really the same thing. Right, so you can parlay just, that. Yeah, just as a G major scale. Right. And G is a minor. Exactly. Is, a, is an E minor, a form of the E minor uh, modes or scale. Right. Or you, you, you help me out with this. So you course. have both facets of it and contained in that scale. Yeah, yeah. Now the pentatonic is kind of uh, major and minor free. It's mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of an oriental. Right. So what it is, um, actually, when I when I uh, do it, I also uh, try to do it all the way across the neck. So right. we're doing two notes per string. Let me ask you, because it's uh, a five-note scale, that's why we're limited to basically two notes in the positions as opposed to three. Good point. Actually, I forgot all about that, but you're totally right. So now if you take part of that pattern, put it together, this is a G major chord. So if you're playing guitar and you had two extra strings there, it would be a for real G major chord. So um, now you know that is a pattern of a chord. And... Uh, made up of those component notes. Now, if you take the pattern that that chord makes, in this case, we'll move this finger up to there. Right. And that sounds rather dissonant. It is. It's a non-resolved something right. or other. Well, it's uh, a G with A in the bass. Yeah, it's a G with A in the bass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Needs resolution, though, you're right. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, New Year's resolution. Anyway, um, <laughs> so there's a G major scale. Um, now, if I take the top notes of that pattern, here comes the bottom notes of the next, of the next uh -huh. position. Now here. There's. Up the active. So what I'm doing there is I'm trying to show the top note of each um, position of a pentatonic scale makes a pattern, right. which in itself is a chord, basically. Right, of some um, type. Yeah, uh, I, see, uh, uh, that I don't know the names of. It but could change depending on what's behind you, you know, harmonically. Yeah, so, okay, you, you bet, that's, that's your department, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll just play it, you explain it. But um, <laughs> Uh, the song that uh, I did with Mr. Big called Had Enough. Right. When I was learning the modes on guitar, the E minor mode, it actually formed a chord by the lower parts of it. And when I strummed that chord, and I actually did all of the chords made up of that uh, mode, it actually seemed to make a reasonable huh. facsimile of kind of a songy type of thing. Okay, well, let's see what that's like on the guitar, if you wouldn't mind demonstrating that. Yeah, uh, hand me that... Uh, that little boy over there, and I'll see what we can do with it here. Um, anyway, uh, the idea when I was practicing guitar, learning a couple uh, uh, things to write some songs, and I write a lot on guitar, but uh, which sounds like an Almond Brothers song, doesn't it? It does, yeah, it has that country flavor to it. <laughs> anyway, um, so I noticed that that chord that that made was part of all those notes there. Became like yeah. It became part of the. So you derive those actually, chords from the mode. Right. So it's an E minor kind of mode. So so that fits all the the any 
pattern. I always wonder how these jazz guys got these amazing uh -huh. chords all over the place because they understand scales so well. Exactly. That they can put uh, any configuration of notes together and come up with an amazo chord thing. So you see these jazz guys doing all these comping chord stuff and you, I was wondering, how in the world do they ever learn all those chords? Well, they just basically know their stuff and they know their scales and they know their, their modes and they know how to put them all together and lightning fast and... And, uh, and that relates exactly to what you're talking about, connecting all the shapes. Right. So what I'm doing basically is just uh, like, so now if I take uh, uh, like a G major... Pentatonic version. So I know if I'm in G. All those. It's all in G. So if I'm playing in the key of G. It's easy to find a spot to go to because you right. know that's your spot. And then you just do variations, part of one, part of another. So. Now, do you visualize the note G somewhere in those shapes? Sometimes I do. Like, for example, um, G major. If I got that note in the middle, this is kind of the simple way I did it when I first started, uh -huh. but it actually still holds true to this day for me anyway. Um, uh, two whole steps here. Whole, two whole steps here and two whole steps on the string underneath. If that's your root, you know that if you got a string above it and below it, it's ridiculously simple. But it, it helps you to get a start right. on the idea of having a pattern and having some place to go. So now, similarly, any of those notes, of those uh, nine notes, work with that. Various combinations can be created. Yeah. All basically in the key. You can, of course, I'm stretching a point, and I don't understand it musically enough to really explain it in those terms. But I'm explaining it in pattern terms. Exactly. So now, once you know that that there's your okay, so that pattern works up here. Or if you have enough fret. But what note is your reference note to? The one G there. The G. In the uh -huh. So now you know anytime you have uh, a key anywhere, again, ridiculously simplistic, if your key is like, you know, that, that, you know that if you're, if you're in a major. That, that, that your pattern around that is such. Of course, there's a million other patterns yeah. around it within the context of a major scale. But so all these things are movable, and yeah. they remain symmetrical. They remain uh, Meaning relatively yeah. the same. So yeah. if you have a particular note, and it's a major uh, scale, and it starts and it has that note there in it, you know that you've got all those notes around it yeah. that you can go to to play if you so desire. So it's really a matter of being selective then with the notes. Once you've accumulated a lot of them, you become selective with what you play yeah, out of those patterns. Exactly. So now instead of just doing it rote pattern thinking, once you're used to moving in those patterns, and you can kind of just step back and let that little machine you created with your hands kind of right. kind of direct it from like a remote control thing. Uh, like directing the machine, the analogy you made uh, speaking earlier about how you use scales. Yeah. Um, basically, you just create. Your, a hand that does all the moves and then you sit back and kind of with your little remote control like with a little race car or something and make it make it work around that's pretty much how i play because mm -hmm. i don't really think about the scales i'm doing i don't right. think about what's going on i'm just kind of uh reaching into the cosmos or the ozone or, or whatever zone that it happens to be <laughs> and trying to find some uh areas there that kind of relay what i'm feeling and thinking at the time or or you know on stage or in the studio or whatever but to give you an idea um, all those notes that I played are those nine notes that work around this G, G included. If you're just... Are there some specific areas of movement that are better than others in connecting these shapes? Um, well, uh, you get used to certain moves with uh -huh. your hands. Like for a long time, for many years, that was my move. So whenever I was solo, if it was an E minor, which is the relative right. minor to G major. Right. 
Uh, so it, I would really be stuck in that pattern for a long time. So I finally forced myself to break out of it <coughs> and make myself do a lot of other things. So the idea of it here, the, the, the final analysis of what I'm talking about is once you understand a shape, and you understand that from one note you've got all these moves you can go to, all these different notes, and you have one stable spot to find is that is your note. That's the key you're in. Now usually, like when I first started bass, it's like, okay, I got a G here. I, I know this move. Paul right. Samuel Smith and the Yardbirds. Exactly. Then we used to do an up, up and octave. It's like, oh, a whole different one. So you saw for like two or three years of my playing, it was just all in that one pattern. And then after a while, you learn to expand it more, and you have more patterns and more option notes to go from G. You can go to there, 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 there. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. So are these shapes you would commonly call on in improvising? Yeah, I guess in the beginning, when you're first starting to understand improvising, I guess you would you would work with shapes. Right. Um, eventually, you get to the point where you're not thinking shapes, you're thinking music. You're not thinking what scale you're doing. You're thinking, I have an emotion and here it is, through, via the bass. Um, I look at uh, learning the shapes and learning all the spots on the neck to understand, uh, similar to in language, because music is in a way a language, uh, learning a little bit of vocabulary. So you get kind of a, it's a building block. Um, sure, when you're in school, you've got to learn spelling and vocabulary and sentence structure, and it's a drag and you hate it. And that's what this kind of is. Learning sentence structure, similar to learning uh, the structure of the patterns. But once you know it, you can speak like we're speaking now. Right. And this is what music should be like. Communication. Just like I'm talking to you. Exactly. Where it's just effortless. And a thinking pattern. You know, let it, and let it fly. And all that comes... Uh, the fluidity of being able to just play something, do a play something, you know, just to play it, uh, comes from just, just years of learning uh, where, what in the world is going on in this space right here. It's a very small amount of space, but you have to understand the patterns and the tunings and uh, all the things that different emotions and major and minor will give you and everything like that. Once you know that, then it's, it becomes music again. So it's all contained in those sets of intervals that we'd spoken about, their orders, and finally the patterns, how they recur. Yeah, that's the technology of it. Right. In real life, you want to play it. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, instructing or explaining, this is not real life. This you have is to just, absorb it and yeah, recreate this is the with the foundation. It. Yeah.